you had a decision to make at a point in time. It was a yep. fork in the road where it was Harvard Law School or it was jump into the music industry with zero background. Yep. On paper, that looks like a very easy decision. <laughs> but It looks crazy. It sounds yeah. crazy. I was in my senior year of college, and there was, it was a local group called Black Gang, and um, I knew one of the members. Uh, his name is now Jay Copes. We kind of bonded, and I heard some of his music, and I liked it, and I had them come out to uh, open up for P&B Rock my senior year of college. And then after that, they decided, they, they were like, hey, can you, um, can you come in a – and manage us and i'm like i don't know anything about management i'm going to school law school i was like i'll do this for the summer <laughs> that was the thought process it wasn't really i was like this can't be that hard you know mm. and i kind of just jumped into it the next thing was they needed a music video for one of their songs the song was called of nba okay and we threw a pretty a semi big um, basketball tournament where like the winners get five hundred dollars and yeah it was it was a pretty big thing we had our own t-shirts for everybody um, it was on power 99 like they were announcing it and stuff oh, wow. so it was it was a really big deal um, we threw that and then that's when I was like yeah I'm not gonna are you that can, can buy <laughs> This side of Jersey podcast, the number one podcast in the world. Stamped. I am your host. My name is Steven. I go by Ugly Steven on Instagram. I'm a little nasally in the nose. Please forgive me. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe at TSOJ Podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, be sure to follow and download at TSOJ Podcast. Now, our next guest is. <sighs> Someone that has been uh, on the waiting list for a long time. Um, we're for very sure. excited to, to, to interview this guest. But before we get into the guest, we've got to get into our layup lines. So for those who do not know, layup lines is a segment where we like to get our guests loose. So we ask a bunch of this or that questions. And your job is to answer in the 24 seconds allotted. Are you ready, sir? I am ready. All right. Got 24 on the clock. Here, I don't want you to see the clock. <laughs> All right. Ready? Set, go. R&B or rap? R&B. Manage an artist or run a label? Label. 360 deal or independent? Independent. Executive produce or a video or a song? Video. Making music or selling music? Making. Distribution deals or 360 deals? Distribution deals. New Jersey or Philadelphia? New Jersey. Being interviewed or politicking with venue owners? Being interviewed. Throwing a concert or scheduling a tour? Ah. ah, that was both for real. Cause that's ah. the same thing, really. And it, I guess, I guess, in my head, scheduling the tour was more consistent. Like well, I feel it, like, like because constantly. because uh, when you're when when you're hands on, like like I am, I feel like you're also throwing the shows on the tour. Huh. So like, if you're independent, no one's booking the stadiums for you. You have to book these events yourself, and essentially, you're throwing a bunch of smaller events in other states. So essentially, you're, you're putting on each show in each city. I had a lot of questions about that because I knew someone who threw their own tour. Yeah, and, and you, I, was, I wonder if that's yeah. just like you have to find the venue yourself. Yeah, you have to make sure that people show up. You have to do the promoting, and usually they'll have someone come in uh, from like that city. Like, let's say there's a Baltimore artist, right? They'll come in, and since they have a fan base, they'll help with that. Hmm. You know, with that drive. Okay, so. But you're essentially, if you're not a big artist and you're throwing your own tour, you're just throwing a bunch of you're individual indi shows. Yes. Right? Okay. And calling it's, it a tour. It's a lot less essentially. Like linear than I thought it was. Yeah. Like, it's okay. not like, yeah, it's not like bigger where we're booking all these venues and people just going to show up. Yeah. It's not like that. You okay. got to actually go in and check out the venue, make sure it's not too big. Some cities you might have a, a 500 person venue, some cities you might have a 50 person venue. So, yo, our next guest, man. He's clearly well versed in the in the in the industry. Just a few titles to start him out with. 
He is the CEO of Rise to Reign. He is a talent manager. He is a digital marketing consultant. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Darren Hicks, the second. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you. We had that long conversation you about the second. <laughs> yeah, we had that long conversation. I wasn't going to mess that up. But, uh, bro, we, uh, we ran into the same problem that we had with Kenneth Muse, where we started talking a lot before the camera started Yeah, running. yeah. And now we got to retrace it's all good. a lot. It's you know all mean? good. So, um, the first thing that you said that kind of caught me, like, off guard was you said you were going you were in stride like it was happening you were going to harvard law school yes so yeah my whole life everybody kept telling me oh you talk too much you 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 know and i I was really smart and uh when i got to college it was kind of a one-track mind where we were just everything was built towards going to law school right i took my lsats i think i got like a 180 Four eighty six, something like that. Something what, what in, does the, that mean? in the upper. It, it's you have to have a certain. Um, you have to be in a certain percentile to get into some of these Ivy League schools, like U Penn. So I got into U Penn, Columbia, all those Ivy uh. League schools. Um, so yeah, it was definitely in the works. Um, I had applied, I got in, and um, yeah, my life just just changed a little bit. All right, let's let's backtrack. Let's backtrack a little bit because when you were. In college, when you first got to college, mm-hmm. from freshman year, you were not distracted. Like no. you were. So, I I find it hard to picture distraction when you go to Harvard Law. When you're when you're proje- if someone told me they were going to Harvard Law, mm-hmm. I would feel like they never went to a frat party a day in their life. They <laughs> never, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they just like yeah studied for this. Well, moment. I definitely want to make it clear that that wasn't my projection i was going to law school but i didn't think i was going to harvard law. i wasn't like i had in my mind i want to go to harvard Harvard law Law. you know obviously i wanted to go to a a, you know a bigger school and the and even going to cheney which i love first hbcu so shout out cheney shout out cheney um they're not necessarily known for um you know being the smartest school or the most prestigious school um and i guess the best advice that i got when i went there was you make it what you want to make it right like we had a lot of schools you go to and you'll have professors that don't that don't have their doctorate degrees every single professor that i had in school was a doctor every every last one not one didn't have a doctorate so i i took pride in that and i also was i was on academic scholarship and if i wasn't on academic scholarship my parents couldn't afford to send me to college so i had to perform yeah in a sense i had to perform um i was also in the keystone honors academy which you have to have like over like a 3.5 to even stay in or even be in the talented 10th per they say Mm -hmm. um to even be included in some of these um scholarships and i also wasn't from pennsylvania which is another thing if you went to pennsylvania if you lived in pennsylvania you got a lot more scholarships from the universities in pennsylvania so i had to go out and really Go get my money. Yeah. <laughs> so I was definitely focused, and I once I caught a rhythm, it was pretty much easy. But I definitely partied. Okay. All right. That's, that's what I was looking for. That's what I was looking for. Okay, you definitely partied. I right. definitely partied. Right. Once I found my rhythm, you know, I think I took early classes. I was 8 a.m., 10 a.m. courses. A lot of people like to not take the 8 a.m. courses because they want to sleep or they've been partying all night. And I just knew that if I sacrificed in the beginning of the day, I could have fun at the end of the day. So people would be like, oh, we got something to do at 12 a.m. I handed that in at 12 Uh, (laughs) p.m. And then they'd be like, Darren's always partying. How is he able to party with us? Because all that idle time that people waste playing the game or doing any of those things, I just was working. And then when it was time to play, like, for real? You could turn up. I could turn up. Yeah. I just wanted to hear about your sins. That's so I had a great, I had a great yeah. time. I wanted to hear about your sin for life. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely in college. College was lit. Yeah, college was lit. Right. Um, okay. So you're, okay, you weren't necessarily saying, like, I'm going to go to Harvard. But you get into Harvard Law School. Yes. Right. By the time I got to, like, junior year, that's when I started to assess, um, you know, you start thinking about, where you're placing your class rank and stuff like that. And I start, I noticed I was top three at the time and it started to get competitive. And um, I actually graduated with two degrees. Um, so it was even harder for me because I was taking 21 credits at a time sometimes. Yeah. But um, 21, what's that? Seven classes? Eight? Yeah. 
Yeah. Seven? Seven. <laughs> Seven classes. Nah, I never did a summer school or a winter class. And I always made sure I did it within that, that semester. When you're doing this, right? Can I, I, I want to, I want to, I was having a lot of thought. No, I, I got talking. you. Yeah. I um, can, I can see the thought. I have a student, <laughs> I have a student who, um, she is 18 years old. Okay. And graduating college. Okay. She's a senior in college. She's, she's going to graduate. She's a senior years. and she's 18. She's a senior in college and she's 18. Okay. That um, is correct. Amazing. Shout um, out to her. Y- yes. However, I'm not going to say her name because I'm not going to divulge her information. But something that she expresses a lot, and it's not s- exactly your situation, but it's similar in terms mm-hmm. of when I think of, like, maturation, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times she doesn't like the response that she gets when people react, oh, my God, you're 18, about to graduate college. Because she said, I'm 18. All my peers are 22. Mm-hmm. Right, like we don't have the same problems, we don't have the same social circles, we don't, we're, we're at different places in life. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. does that make sense? Mm-hmm. On paper, we're both the same grade, but like we are in two totally different worlds. That's gotcha. what she was saying, right? Um, and this could just be the ignorance in me talking, obviously, but it still feels like for you to be going to the the heights that you went to in terms of like you're in this direction of like, I'm kind of like the smartest of the smartest. And I'm like, you know what I mean? Yeah. In some way, I'm assuming that you had to feel separated from your peers. So, and maybe that's just me speaking from my circle of low achievers. No, yeah, no, <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't no, know, no, like, no. I, I, I get, I get where you're coming at. Right. But I, I definitely had a good set of friends that kept me grounded. Right. Like I, so I had a, a, a friend, a childhood friend that I've known since four years old, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we played football, basketball, lived together. Like, I knew him, and, you know, we kind of lost touch in high school, but then we went to college together. And um, he was supposed to be my roommate. Some things happened. I didn't really have too many roommates in college. I made sure I had my own room. But um, how, do you, how do you do that? Uh, being an RA. I decided I was going to – I was like – I did everything in college, right? Like, so I was an RA, and we got to have our own rooms, or we got to at least pick our roommates if we wanted roommates. Um, and when I went to Cheney, that was the first year they had, like, a new, new building. So this is the new building where they have, like, the sweet style living, and it's, it's a really nice – they got 60-inch TVs in each lounge. Like, it's really nice. Um, I don't know what they did to it now, but I was there for the first year that that happened. Um, but they kept me grounded. Um, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't have had as much fun. They're the ones that got me into, to drinking. I don't get drone drinking in college, but, (laughs) 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 but, um, yeah, in college, man, they got me into drinking and just got me into just having fun. Right. Like, you know, I was already disciplined in doing my schoolwork, but my friends had to tell me like, D like, we only going to be here for a little bit, like have some fun, you know, and without them, I probably wouldn't have had as much fun. And obviously, like all people that go to college, you have friends that come and go. But, yeah, my friends my friends was locked in with me. That's so. fire. Shout out to them, bro. That's a good thing to have. That's a beautiful thing to have. All right, so you said junior year you started to assess. You were playing with the Keystone Scholarship. Yeah, I was in the like Keystone Honors Academy. Academy. So it's like a smaller school within uh, Cheney University mm-hmm. where basically all the kids on scholarship are in. And we have yeah. a different set of curriculum a different set of rules. We have to go to certain events to keep our scholarship. We have to maintain a certain GPA. We also have to do a Keystone, um, like a Keystone project, which is essentially like a dissertation. Um, so we had stuff outside of- undergrad? Yeah, outside of stuff that we were already doing because we, because our degrees have that Keystone, you know, There's a reputation there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So you had to do that in order to keep your scholarship, stay in the program, it was a lot, mm. but they had the, we had they had separate housing for us and everything if we wanted it. Yeah. So it was definitely an elite group of and, kids. And when did Harvard become the reality? So Harvard became the reality. I still wasn't really thinking about Harvard until I took my LSAT. I took it the first time. I did fairly well, yeah. um, but I just took it again just because it was free, right? Like you know, they I, I had some type of situation where they gave it to me for free. They waived my fee. So I'm like, I'll take it as many times as I feel like yeah, it, you facts, know. Facts. Um, 
and I studied for it, but I didn't really like study extremely hard for it. But um, I took it the second time, and yeah, I, I scored in in like that that high percentile. And you didn't study the first time or the second time? I di- I didn't study either time really, but I went over the book a little more the second time. But I didn't take any classes for it. I didn't have any help with it. I didn't know any. I didn't talk to anybody that's taken the test before. I went in there and I just I took it. I think I think LSAT test. It's I don't know. Have you ever even seen an LSAT test? No. So basically, the I've, test. I've seen Suits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Suits is great though. I love Suits, but it's a great um, analysis. Like it, it's all about analyzing a situation and is this the best situation? So every answer on the test is correct. It's about which one's the most correct. It's like open, like you have to basically justify yeah, but the open-ended response. Yeah, but it's not even an open-ended response. It's still multiple choice. And all of these answers are correct, but you have to pick the most correct oh, one. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So all of the answers are correct. So yeah. you can't even be like. Like, I can't do this in a situation. No, you can. It's just yeah. Like, you really can do. do everything that they're saying. All of this is correct. But which one is the most correct? And I think that's what bothers people with the test because it's not really your intellect or like how smart you are. It's about you being able to pick something and stick with it, really. Because you second guess yourself in that test and it's over. So the first answer you get, pick that answer. I feel like, but what I'm interpreting what you're saying as is that you are Mike Rawls from Suits. Like, you just... Essentially, yes. Kind of pulled up, like, all right. Uh, essentially, like, yes. Ah. Obviously, Mike Rawls is a character, and right, he right, was, right. like, a super genius. <laughs> but essentially, like, I have that capability of going into a classroom, and if I'm in the classroom, I don't have to take notes. I don't have to th- I don't have to do any of that. I can listen to the lecture, look at what it, they wrote on the board, and I can remember it. Do you have... Of actual photographic memory, or do no? You think you just, I think it's just, more of like a. I think it's more of an attention span to like just stay locked in to conversation because I noticed when I was in school. If I would miss class, it would be rough for me, right? Like, if I'm missing class and I'm not hearing these lectures and I'm not understanding what's being said and I'm not hearing it, then that would be rough for me. But if I if I hear you say it, so it's not really like photographic. It's more like it's like sonic, sonic, yeah, yeah in a sense. So I would remember every single thing that my professors would tell me. Even to this day, I remember a lot of it. How's your memory? My memory's great, but if I care about it, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to remember things that I don't necessarily care about. Can somebody come to you and say, you said we had this conversation on this day, and you said no. Like, they can't pull that card away. No, you can't. No. Unless you come with some hard yeah, core yeah, yeah. evidence and facts, but you can't if you have nothing and you just your word. No, yeah. no, absolutely not. Wow, absolutely not. Okay, the only you're, person that can do that is Kenneth Muse. By the way, shout out to Kenneth Muse. <laughs> <laughs> I, you're start, you, I feel like you're becoming more scary as we talk. Why are you scary? Yeah, you're becoming more like I don't forget things and like. No, I don't it's fuck it's fine. And it's like, fine. Yeah, you're great at what you do. So I feel like I'm just like. This is your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is your podcast. I am here to answer questions. Oh, uh, all right. I am not analyzing. All right. I, I, <laughs> all right. Let's go back to Harvard. Let's go back to Harvard Focus. Got gotcha. you. Let's go back there. Okay. So you take the LSATs. Yes. You kill it. Kill them. And now you're like, oh, shit. I can actually do this. Yeah. Yeah. I already. It's like the scores come back and then you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't really, I want to say I was excited, but I wasn't really excited because I think I was more focused on trying to get valedictorian at the time. And even though that it doesn't really mean anything, yeah. it was just like in, in high school, I was really good at school. I went to four different high schools, but I graduated like top 10 in the class, even with going to so four different, different high schools. Yeah. Um, but I feel like when the realization that I could get valedictorian actually came about and I'm like, I just had to finish strong. I think I was more focused on that than mm. anything. Like I was just being competitive, that yeah. competitive nature that we were talking about earlier with sports. is just it just kind of came out of me when I'm, you know, I was just I got I got to win. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was really a sport at that point, or at least that's how I looked at it. So, yeah, OK, so now Harvard is reality. Mm hmm. Everyone's like, oh, my God, Darren's going to Harvard, ah, right? I didn't even tell a lot of people, honestly. 
I didn't tell my mom. I didn't tell anybody. Why? Is that like a childhood trauma? I think be because I got into almost every Ivy League that it was just like, I think everybody was so used to it, right? Like it was just you, like every year my mom's posting straight A's, like every year. <laughs> like for four years, every single semester she's posting Facebook, Instagram, she's posting that I'm getting straight A's. So I feel like by the time I actually graduated, it was like, it was kind of killed. Can I ask you a question though? Yeah. What does that do to your sense of accomplishment? What does accomplishment mean to you then? If sometimes yeah. I, I do have a hard time sitting and being able to like revel in success, right? Like it's hard to be able to like analyze my own success because I'm always thinking of the next thing. Um, it's hard to be happy for myself in certain instances when I do stuff. And in this industry, once you do one thing, let's say you sell out a show tomorrow, I got to do something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? So this industry is is very much you're always chasing your own tail in a sense. Like you're always uh, trying to achieve more. Um, I'm just going to pivot us to now the industry because I yeah. think I think like we're ready now. Yeah, I no think. problem. And it's crazy because I could spend all day talking about Harvard stuff. And yeah, and I can definitely yeah. talk about college and school all day. Yeah. too. Um, but I think where we can kind of pivot this to where like now we're getting into your expertise. A little mm -hmm. bit, right. Is you had a decision to make at a point in time, it was a yep. fork in the road, where it was Harvard Law School, or it was jump into the music industry with zero background. Yep. On paper, that looks like a very easy decision, <laughs> but- It looks crazy, it sounds yeah. crazy. So it talk sounds about, crazy. Talk, talk first about the opportunity that presented itself in the music industry, and then you weighing those options. Okay, so um, I, obviously we talked about this earlier, but now you know we're gonna talk about it on the pod, but I was, in my senior year of college, and there was, it was a local group called Black Gang. I, I know you've heard of them. Shout out Black Gang. Shout out Black Gang. Um, they're not a, you know, not a group anymore, but back in the day, around 2016, uh, they were a group, and they were relatively successful in the area. And um, I knew one of the members. Uh, his name is now Jay Copes. Uh, Jay Dope back in the day. So if I say Jay Dope, please mm -hmm. don't. Shout out Jay Copes. Don't now. get upset. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I knew him, and uh, we kind of bonded, and I heard some of his music, and I liked it, and I had them come out to uh, open up for P&B Rock my senior year of college. And then after that, they decided, they, they were like, hey, can you um, can you come and, uh, and manage us? And I'm like, I don't know anything about management. I'm going to school, law school. Yeah. I have no, <laughs> I had yeah. no want to even want to do that. But I did have some time in the summertime in between law school and um, graduating. Um, and yeah, I just kind of had a meeting with them and I was like, I'll do this for the summer. <laughs> that was the thought process. It wasn't really, I was like, this can't be that hard, you know? Mm. And I kind of just jumped into it. So when you say for the summer, you mean like, assuming I'm, not, I'm still going to Harvard in the fall. Yeah, assuming right. I'm still going yeah, to Harvard okay. in the fall. Yeah. So you take on this summer job, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you take on the summer job and what, what, what's, what's the, what's the experience? What? So the experience um, when I was in Jersey, it was mostly an online gig where I was just um, I was just filling out uh, information for football stars around the country and, and things of that sort. Because it was un it was under Under Armour, but uh, shout out Ricardo Dickerson, who was um, my mentor at the time, who was the one I was doing the internship with. Um, I was pretty much just doing anything and anything they needed w when it came to like. Um, administrative things um, and then when I went out to Phoenix to where he lived um, we worked with Alex Lynn and I helped them with his or you know his foundation the Alex Lynn foundation Lend lend a hand foundation um, and honestly I just that was the first time I was living man I'm just like dang I'm out here in Phoenix I'm with NBA stars Devin Booker was out there uh, Eric Bledsoe like I'm meeting these guys and it was it was Alex Lynn's birthday so we were out there and just living our lives and um, I was out there for a while and then I had to come back because Black Gang was throwing a mansion party. Shout out to the mansion party because mm -hmm. it was lit. Mm -hmm. um, but can I had I, to come I back. Can I stop you for that. a second? Yeah. Just to ask some questions. So, how do you get to. So, you say yes to the gig. Yep. You're kind of doing the administrative things behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Not behind closed doors, but you're doing the administra administrative mm -hmm. things. What is in between you doing that and now you're with Devin Booker in this room? Like, did somebody like an opportunity come up in the inbox? Did like you get their no? So we were so I was over the internship. The person I was doing the internship under, 
he managed Alex Lynn already. Like, he managed uh, him out there okay, in Phoenix. Okay. Alex Lynn was playing for the Phoenix Suns at the time, i.e. why I had to go to Phoenix. So, around this time, it's Alex Lynn's birthday, and the manager, they're all doing stuff for the Linda Hand Foundation and also stuff for his birthday. So, I was around helping with the birthday party, helping with the Linda Hand Foundation, and I was doing all those things, but it's his birthday around this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm meeting Devin Booker and I'm meeting Eric Bledsoe. I'm meeting all these people just because I'm in the house for the party. Okay, maybe I'm missing something. How did the internship come about? Is he's, this an internship? So he's a family friend, right? Like, so okay, I went okay, to okay. a lot of my stories can turn into a lot of, like bigger stories. So I try okay, not okay. to get too deep into you. Okay, it. Okay, okay. Um, he's a family friend that uh, that met my dad when we were you know younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also was in the league for a little bit, played for the Raiders a little bit, like. But he went to Maryland. He played D1. He was a linebacker and a um, right. fullback. And uh, he now works with LeVar Arrington. They also have a podcast. So shout out to LeVar Arrington and, and them. Um, but he's a family friend. And he was okay. the one that reached out to me to be a part of okay. what they had going on. And that's how I got out there. So the Alex Lynn situation was totally separate. But when I went out there, I just helped them with whatever they needed. So, okay. Yeah. So now this is all in the span of a summer. Yes. Okay. This is all. I graduate May. Yeah. I'm in Phoenix in June or, yeah, I'm in Phoenix in June. Okay. So now you come back for the manager party, obviously, Black, yep. Black Anko's manager party. So now you're back in Jersey. I'm back. Okay. I should have stayed, but I was back. Okay. Back. <laughs> it was lit, but I So stayed. now you have, after this Phoenix endeavor, mm-hmm. are you now a little more enticed by- No. No, okay. no, no. You're still Harvard is nope. still what's going on. Yeah, I'm still Harvard. Okay. Okay. So you come back to Jersey and then, okay. But I that? am- very very much intrigued like my my the mansion party i came back it was wildly successful amazing event yeah and i'm like dang we we did that and it and it it, it, i definitely my interest was finally sparked okay i will say that but you're still hard but i'm still going hard yeah okay yeah so now we still have i guess another month and a half to play with before you decided that you were yep going to pivot okay so talk let's talk about that month and a half Mm -hmm. left of summer so we did that, but then right after that, we, we were always, were, like I said, it's always the next move in this industry. Yeah. So we were thinking about the next thing. The next thing was they needed a music video for one of their songs, but they wanted to make it huge. Like, they wanted to make it a big thing. And I'm like, I, I think we all come up with throwing a, a basketball party. The song was called of NBA. Okay. And we threw a pretty, a semi-big um basketball tournament where like the winners get five hundred dollars and yeah it was it was a pretty big thing we had our own t-shirts for everybody um it was on power 99 like they were announcing it and stuff so it was it was a really big deal um we threw that and then that's when i was like yeah i'm not going to harvard anymore just like that just like that it wasn't even yeah what about it made you say i'm no longer going to harvard Harvard. Well, there was that conversation that we had earlier, right, where these Ivy League schools don't give out full rides, right? No matter how smart you are, no matter what school you came from, a lot of them don't give out full academic scholarships for these places. Their biggest thing is you're going to get a job as soon as you leave here because that's it's the that's school the that they're at. Yeah. Um, so I was just like, do I really want to be a lawyer? Like, that's what I was thinking to myself. I'm like, People my whole life was telling me that I'm, I'm supposed to be a lawyer. You should be a lawyer. But I never once sat there and thought about it. Like, mm-hmm. do I really want to be a lawyer? So I started to call family members that I knew were lawyers. These are like extended family members, not even like really close family members, but people I just know are lawyers. Mm-hmm. I'm calling them, asking them. Most of them are telling me if they could do it over again, they wouldn't. Most every, mostly every, all of them, even lawyers that I talk to to this day. Most of them love the money, and some of them don't even love the money because if you're not in corporate law, you're not making that much, you know? Really? Like, not DA, law if you're working like in, like, the DA's office and stuff, you're getting paid regular $50,000 jobs, like, you know, which is not a knock on anybody makes $50,000, but it's, it's not, not what you think it it's is. It's not right? a lawyer, not yeah. for you to go to school like that, that vigorous. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, a lot of, I started talking to people, and they started telling me they wouldn't do it, and they weren't trying to, like, discourage me. They were just saying, like, it wasn't it like you know for them like if they had to do it over again they're already lawyers now and um yeah i just decided that that wasn't my path i had a conversation with my mom and 
she was like, go for it. And my mom, she's she was an entrepreneur and all those different things. So she she didn't even she didn't hesitate. She didn't even say anything. She was just like, yeah, do what you want to do. It's crazy because nowhere in this story have you mentioned being like afraid of. I was never afraid. Yeah, like there, there's no, no like. <laughs> I was wondering if like even when I asked you about when we, off camera we were talking about the Harvard versus joining the industry thing, you kind of were like, yeah, like I. It I was a like feeling, was bro. Normal. Like it was a real legit feeling. Like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like I didn't know what I. I didn't know like how it was going to get done. Yeah. And all like I couldn't call my story now, but it felt right. Like it just felt right. And the and and me being a lawyer, it felt more forced. Like it felt like I was just doing what appeased everybody. Mm-hmm. It was easy because I didn't have to think. I just had to do my work. I I don't want I don't want to mention this so early because there's so much more of your story that mm-hmm. will like I think this would like uh mean more at the end of your story. Yeah. But it came up so I want to ask like what have you conceptualized the thought or the idea? Like I'm listening to the story and I'm hearing you basically say like the total trajectory of your life like 180 over a summer yeah essentially yeah I have, but like everything you, you worked for for 20 some years yeah over the course of a summer yeah essentially just like pivoted and went totally yeah i never awesome. i never thought i would be in the music industry that was never a thought of mine like i i played around with it in college but not anything serious enough to be like i'm gonna change my mind about what i'm doing with my life everything was towards going to law school and being a lawyer Okay, so <laughs> we make the jump. Yeah, we go into the music industry, mm-hmm. right? So obviously now you're like, like I made it to the NBA, but like I gotta get minutes, I gotta get endorsements, I gotta get right. Yeah. So like, how are you now trying to pave a way? So my biggest thing own? was I didn't know anything, so I did as much research as I could, right? Like, and then certain things, even when I re- when I researched it, I didn't understand it. So now I'm reaching out to people and I'm just asking questions. I'm going to every single event you can go to. I'm also listening to the artists that I'm managing because they've been doing it for three, four years. And I slowly started to understand that they didn't know a lot of things as well. Like they're just, they really just want to make the music. Mm -hmm. Um, But they know a few people more than I did, but they never really, you know, they didn't really introduce me to people and things of that sort. So my biggest thing was, let me meet as many people as possible. That was my biggest thing just meet as many people as possible. I was at every single event from 2016 to 2017. Every single event. And you're doing this from New Jersey? Mm-hmm. Okay. Every, all of this is from New Jersey. Okay. All of it. So you networked, you built... Uh, yep, so I'm, I'm networking between Philly and Jersey. Okay. And then, at this time, are you still working with Black Gang? Are you yeah, so, okay. so 2016, I was still working with Black Gang. Uh, I actually wind up um, starting my own company around the time, right? I was, uh, you know, there's just a lot of things you have to learn when you get into the music industry. And I think I got into it from a non-selfish standpoint. I'm still in it from a non, being a manager in general is a non-selfish, selfish, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, very selfless um, job. But I think the biggest thing that I did was, um, I got into it because I cared about the individuals, right? Like, I actually cared about Black Gang. I cared about the individuals in Black Gang. And I think that's where I had my my mind was, right? It wasn't really focused on more. So I was focused on getting them opportunities and not focused on the business of it. Mm-hmm. I was, on, But that's what made me great at first, right? Because I really, how many people really, really care about who they work with? And, and I think that's that's what I've always kept, but there were humbling situations where I noticed that just because I give out love doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to get that back. So I had to kind of get my business together. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I started my own company. And, yeah, I started signing other artists at the time. Uh, so. And when you went to these other artists, in terms of leverage that you are providing them, are you saying, like, here's what I did with Black Gang? Now this is the this is the craziest thing in the world, and to this day it's still like this. 
every artist or talent that I've ever managed, I never approached them. I never approached them and asked them to manage them, ever. That never happened. All of it has always been organically just come together. And it's insane to say because so many people are DMing me, asking me to be their manager, or I've talked to a lot of people that have asked me to be their manager, but I've never, not once, went up to somebody and was like, hey, I want to be your manager. It's never, that's never happened. And since it's never happened, is that now a, you never will? It's almost in a sense, yeah. Like, obviously, we scout talent, and, it, the you know, the bigger we get and the more, you know, resources that we get, I'm sure there's going to be instances where I reach out to artists that I think are up and coming and that I think have good work ethic um, to work with them. But as of now, as of, you know, <laughs> I have never reached out to anyone to be their manager. Is there a – give me a checklist, not uh, as much as you can, a checklist of what you are looking for in an artist. Okay, checklist. So – First checklist is be a good person. Okay. Okay? Because if you're talented and you're a douchebag, I don't care. Actually, I got one better. Let's turn into our segment that we haven't named yet. We haven't named the segment yet. Got you. So I'm the um, first for this segment, or you just You're not the name first, it? no. We just you just didn't, didn't name it yet. Yeah, we've been doing it way so. too long, actually, to not have a name. But <laughs> we definitely put a name on it. But um, hi, uh, Mr. Hicks. How you doing? Um, my name is Little Ranger. Um, I have did business with Kevin Oh, Muse. Little Ranger. Yeah, I've, yes. done, I've done business with yes, Kevin Yes, he Kevin told Muse me about before. your, yeah. yeah. Um, about he, your he, he turned me down. It was kind of weird. Um, yeah. No bad blood or don't anything. Get, but don't, don't be offended. Yeah, I he just. He turns down a lot of folk. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, my name's Little Ranger. Um, I'm from, uh, I'm from Pensacola, New Jersey. Okay. Um, assume that my music is good. Assume that my music is good. Good. Um, good or great? Or we just good. good. It's good. Just good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hicks, I want you to manage me because um, I've, I've I've seen what you've done in the industry. Um, you know, you're a fellow Jersey guy. Um, here's 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 the thing. I'm not really big on the I'm not really big on the music video thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not really my thing. I do like to make the singles. I I prefer to have like a Frank Ocean kind of appeal. Okay, you know, where it don't got to be seen too much. Okay, you know. Well, um, you're not Frank Ocean. That's the first thing I would say. It's the first thing I would say. Am I not Frank Ocean? You're not, or or you're do you not, not believe in me the way no, you would you're believe not in Frank Ocean. That's just that we're just gonna stop that right there. But I would also say, Little Ranger, that if you want to be in this industry right now, as of twenty twenty three, going into twenty twenty four, you have to make music videos. You have to make content. There is no excuse or way around it. There is no other way. You have to, or you don't want to be an artist. Okay, I'll make music videos. I'll make music videos for you, Mr. Hicks. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for taking the conversation, because we didn't even get this far with Kenneth Muse. Got so, you. You know, that guy. <laughs> Kenneth, if you're watching this, just know you're seeing the opportunity that happened that you could have had. You're, ha you're seeing it happen right now. <laughs> um, I'm finding my match right here. Um, yeah, I'm not big on albums either. Yeah. You know, I'm just like a, you know, I'm a singles kind of guy. Okay. Well, um, that works, honestly, right now, yeah. because if you're uh, just starting out, um, it doesn't make sense to push out a ton of music. It makes sense to just funnel s singles out and budget behind them before you get to any type of project. Then once you get to the fan base, once, you're, once your fan base is letting you know they want more, then you give them a project. But you don't need to right now. I got to say, this this... This 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 rise to rain feels like home. Well, we try we try to rise to rain, man. Yeah, Shout out the team. send me some paperwork. I'm ready to sign. I got you. I'm ready to sign. Little Ranger. It was great working with you. You know what I mean? It's great working with you too. Now I don't want to say any names. I feel like you're a good person. That's oh, my number one. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you're a good person. And I just wish Kenneth Muse saw that. Well, good thing is when you work with Rise to Rain, you work with Kenneth Muse. So oh, technically, is that? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, we got to <laughs> <laughs> like, like, <laughs> shout out Kenneth Hughes, man. Shout out Kenneth Hughes. Shout out Kenneth Hughes. All right. But there is a checklist of like you, you are looking for something. Yeah. I mean, I'm def I mean, I'm definitely looking for good person first and foremost, but sometimes I don't know these people before they send me the music. <coughs> so I will say that I am looking for good music first and foremost. Okay. Mind you, it doesn't have to be good to me. It can be good in a sense that I know that there's a fan base for you out there. 
and that you're marketable. Okay. What is what's 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 marketable? What's that? So like you know you have the little Uzis and the Playboy Cardis. That's not really my my thing. Like mm-hmm. I'm not really a fan of that. The mm-hmm. Ragers per mm-hmm. se, or you know the Yeats and those guys. I'm not really a fan of that type of style of music. Obviously Uzi, I love Uzi, so we're not talking about Uzi. Mm-hmm. But I'm you know I'm not really a fan of of some of the more ragey music. Obviously I understand it as a marketer. I understand there's a pocket for it. I understand that there's a way for it and that there's fan base for it so i don't necessarily have to like the music but i know if it's good for that pocket if that makes sense okay. <coughs> so are you good at knowing so so i i'm almost like not good at knowing what good rager music is because to me it almost all sounds very similar like sometimes i'm like yo how do you sign this guy versus that guy Based on the sound of the music, like you know what I'm saying, like well, it's like I think they, I think that's when when the music sounds similar. I feel like that's when you get into the are you marketable, are you a good person, are you willing to put the work in to achieve what you need to achieve? Because sometimes there's people that are insanely talented that aren't going anywhere because they don't listen, they don't take direction very well, they're not willing to put that work in. So there's a lot of there's a lot of checkpoints, but. I think I always go with like a six month trial period because honestly, just because you're a good artist and maybe you might have the work ethic, maybe it might not work out. Maybe you don't like the way that I work. Maybe I don't like the way you work. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to succeed. It doesn't mean that I'm not a good manager. It just means that we don't fit. I feel like management is like a marriage in a sense because y'all both have to work on it. You're not, it's not one size fits all. Just because you're a good manager for this person doesn't mean you're a good manager for this person. There's plenty of artists who are popping. Let's just throw an ice spice out there or anybody. I don't know her manager, Mm -hmm. but just because her manager does well for her doesn't mean that manager is going to be doing well for you because the opportunities arise differently for different artists. How do you know as as the talent manager, how do you know when an artist is worth being flexible for like i think i think it's a can they do like a one infraction thing and then it's like this is not well yeah i think once i think it's similar to what i said with a marriage i feel like once you're in it like once i it takes a lot for me to decide we're going to sign this contract and we're going to get in we're and essentially we're going to get in bed together for me for business right like i don't feel like I'm going to give up after one try, right? But I also have done this a long time to where I'm not going to ignore red flags either. Mm. I think being transparent and letting them know up front, if you do not want to listen to me or listen to what I have to say, then there is no hard feelings. You can you can run your own career because at the end of the day, this is your career. But if you want to work with me, I'm going to tell you what's best for you based on my assessment. But at the end of the day, it's still your career. I don't run your career. So if you don't want to listen, you go ahead. It's that simple. I don't think I make it hard anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like in the beginning of my career, I feel like I was um, beholden of artists a little bit, right? If an artist wasn't moving or wasn't working as hard as they could work, I felt like I was stagnant. But that's not the case anymore, you know? So either you want to listen and you want to you wanna get more popular, or more popular, popping, whatever, however you, you want to be, you want to reach your goals, then you need to listen. And that's just that simple. You know what I mean? And a lot of artists think they need managers. And in the re- in the beginning, beginning, you don't really need a manager if you don't have anything to manage. I think that's the biggest thing. Like, people don't put in enough work to require a manager. What What is... What is the amount of work required to have a manager? I think that's different for everybody. It could take somebody three months to show me that. It could take somebody two years to show me that. And like I said, um, I'll even bring up my, you know, my newest signee, which is High Note. Um, shout out High shout Note. Out High Note. Yeah, we gonna shout you know, out High Note. Everybody go listen to Teach Your Son right now. But um, also shout out Kenneth Muse because he produced that shout record. Out Muse as well. <laughs> shout out Muse as well. For sure. So um, with High Note, um, he was doing music for two, three years. With, probably about two years before we even locked in with him and I knew who he was because I used to work with his brother and their family so um we always reposted his music he would send it to us and we would listen to it but we never reached out to him to work with him or anything like that 
because at the end of the day, I, I, like we talked about before, you could be doing music one minute and then the next minute real life hits you and you're not doing music anymore. So I think people that really take this serious and this is really their profession, um, I feel like that shows over time. And it also shows in your work ethic. How many songs are you actually putting out? Do you Are you actually trying to put effort in your music videos? Like I can see, even if it's not at the level that it needs to be, I can see the work, you know what I mean? And High Note put in that work. And that's, that's something I want to ask too, right? So like when you say like, I, before I remember you saying that you, you would do something like a six month trial or something mm -hmm. like that. Are you looking at the back catalog and then saying like this, like I'll work with you? Or are you saying like your back catalog is, uh, let's do six months. And so let me tell you something. So back catalog, depending on how good the songs are and like what type of artists I feel like they are. Like let's say an artist has already been popping and they've been doing music for four or five years and they already have an extensive fan base because that's happened as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, it's different from an artist who's just starting out, who's probably done music for a while, but never put out any music videos, never done all of those things. So it's, yeah. it's a, it's really a by person basis. Yeah, circumstantial. Okay. Um, but I will say is because I have worked with Kenneth Muse for a long time, I like when he's able to influence an artist in a way to where I feel like it can elevate their music. And I feel like Kenneth elevates everyone's music that he touches. Like, Every all the music that he touches, he elevates their music. That's fire. You know, and I've been around a lot of engineers, a lot of producers, but I feel like when he connects with someone, because he, you don't connect with everybody, mm -hmm. when he connects with someone musically, it's over. It's over. That's fire. That's fire. So, <coughs> um, when you look at artists and and like you're looking to work with them, are you looking at a period of time like you're saying, okay? I think this is going to be a five year situation or is it kind of like an indefinite? Well, I definitely I start with one year. Like I said, okay. if I know if I'm unsure, I'll yeah. do six months. If I'm sure, I'll do a year. OK, so by that year, like the by that year. They they know they want to stay or they don't want to stay at okay. it. Like they usually stay. Yeah. <laughs> what flexible where have you been flexible with an artist? Where Where is somewhere where? you kind of had this position or this stance or this role or this whatever and an artist has come and made you think twice about your stance or it made you kind of be flexible well in the beginning like i said i feel like i was more beholden right like so i feel like i was more so letting them choose what they wanted to do instead of me like trying to because like at the end of the day this is a selfless position i'm trying to help you with your career it's not my career yeah. it's me literally involving myself in your own career so I feel like that's the that's the selflessness of it because it's not my career. It's yours. Obviously, if you win, I win. But it's a way different percentage than if, right, <laughs> you right, know, right, what I mean? it's not right, like I get 50 percent. Yeah. Right. You know, what I mean, yeah. um, so I feel like in the beginning, I used to let them drop music like whenever they wanted to, like wasn't really fighting back on. I think you should drop this record or I think you should drop this record. I feel like it was just like they would pick the record and I would just do everything that I was supposed to do for the rollout. Okay. Um, now, since I've gotten more established, I think I pretty much tell them what I think. Obviously, I give them their, their uh, it's your career at the end of the yeah. day. So <laughs> you can tell me if you don't like this idea or not. Yeah. But most of the time, I feel like I have a good like energy with the artist to know like, okay, it's between these songs, like give me a choice. Like, it's between these three songs. Okay, then I get to pick the song from those three. Yeah. And I think I'm lenient because I think even High Note, I think he wanted to release some music, and I was like, nah, not not now. And then he was like, nah, please, like, I'll release this song, like, to do this. And, and we wind up releasing it, and he's actually had a really good run this year. So All I think right. I'm lenient in that All sense right. where I kind of, I let you kind of dictate your career within limits because – at the end of the day, I feel like I'm kind of the captain of the ship where I'm like, you know, I'm trying to get us to the destination. Yeah. And obviously you're the ship in a sense, right? The artist is the ship. Mm -hmm. So we can't get there without you. But you also can't get there without the captain either because you don't know where you're going. So you kind of let them expand a little bit. Yeah. With it, like they're not going to pummel their career. Yeah. But at first, I feel like when you're managing, managers don't feel like they have the power to say exactly what they want. Right. Like. I don't know, like some managers are friends. Some managers are just people that you meet and then you become friends. 
But like sometimes when you're first starting out and you you don't you're not as confident, you don't feel like you can assert yourself and say what you believe. And a lot of times you just don't even know. Mm. You know, if I don't know what I'm doing, how can I tell you what to do? <laughs> does, does a does an artist ever come up to you and say, "Yo, yo, yo, Darren, like, look at this, look at this, look at this four bars I got real quick. Tell me, like, tell me what you think." You know, you want to know a funny <laughs> story, man? I was getting my oil changed at um, what is it, uh, Pet Boys? Okay. Oh my goodness, Darren Hicks, yo, bro, what's up, bro? Yo, I, I rap, bro. I'm like, you work here, bro, like. Like I'm trying to just get my service right, at the like time. Right like now I, I'm a customer. Yeah, right? you feel what I'm saying? Like, can we get the can we get the the oil change done before <laughs> before we get to the rap? Man, my boy rap for me, man. And it was trash. Yeah. I'm sorry, whoever. If you see this, it was trash. This recently? Nah, it was okay, just okay, like okay, fine, two right. years ago, yeah. but it was trash. Yeah, it was trash. So what are you? What's like? How are you portraying that to him? Well, Are you telling him straight so up? So this is it? my thing. Like, I, I feel like I'm not getting anybody else in trouble with this, with what I'm about to say. But someone, and they know who they are because I'm going to say someone. Uh, someone told me, you know, and I might be telling on him right by saying this anyway. But they told me to let him know that it's just not for me. It's just not for me. <laughs> That's fine. No, she <laughs> <laughs> that was fire, bro. Was <laughs> if you got it, you got it. If you didn't, you didn't. You did, you we, did. we know if you watch TSOJ podcast. Yeah. We know. We know if you watch it. It's just not for me, uh, man. Wow. Okay. That's a okay. fact. And that's how, that's how you just laid it out. It's not for me. Yeah, it's just not for me. I think, and if I think that, I tell you, I told you before when we we were talking about just the raging situation. It's not my cup of tea, but I I don't say it's trash. Like I don't be like this is awful. Now if it's awful, it's awful. But I understand that just because I'm not a fan of it doesn't mean that it's trash. So even if I'm not a fan of it and I tell you it's not for me and I think it's still good, I'll let you know, like, yo, I'm not, this isn't my type of music, but, like, I think this, this shit could go. Like, I think it could go. So that's, that's, that's kind of my question, too. I'm so, like, I don't know. When I get music industry people where I just, like, I try yeah, to yeah, nah. get everything out of my head that I possibly can. So, like, if you say, so, for example, Playboy Cardi is not your genre of music, not right? Not so then how do you know what's good and what's not? I think it's the marketer in me, right? I think I know we okay. haven't pivot, okay. pivoted to that at, at a point, but I feel like when you're marketing music, you start to understand what people like and what people don't like when you're marketing it to people, okay. to broad mass audiences. You're like, okay, so this is the type of stuff they like. Okay, this is the type of stuff they like. Because essentially when you're marketing it, either it's going to do well or it's going to flop. You know what I mean? There's no in between. If they like it, they'll keep listening. If they don't like it, you they won't click on it. Um, and I feel like through doing that for so many different artists over time, even artists that aren't my artists, just being a marketer in general, has shown me that you can, you know, what's good and what's not good. And just being in the studio so much now, I've been, I have way over ten thousand hours in the studio nowadays. You know what I mean? So I think I've listened to enough music. And like I said. It's not the end all be all if somebody does not like your music. Like, don't think that if I say I don't like your music means you're, you're trash. Yeah. Like, it just might not, I might not be the one that's supposed to listen to it. Mm. You know what I mean? But that also doesn't mean that just because, like, if I, <laughs> doesn't mean it's just good. Like, it yeah. could be trash, bro. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I will say there's a lot more trash out there than there is good yeah. music. So, you know. <laughs> you have more no conversations than you have. Yeah, yes conversations. yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. And I feel like, I still try to help people who I don't like their music, right? Like, I don't just manage people, right? Like, I'm a consultant too, so like, I might consult you for six months and just give you advice on what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. And it might not be management because I'm not, like you said, I'm not a, uh, what was the word you said earlier where I wasn't uh, changing around my schedule or like. Being flexible. Yeah, right? I, yeah, I'm not being flexible for you in a sense. Like, I'm not gonna book sessions and move my sessions around to make sure I'm there, but I'm going to give you the advice. You're going to, I'm going to tell you how much you're supposed to save. I can introduce you to different videographers so that your budget isn't being overkilled on just videos. I'm also the marketer, so I can be your digital marketer at the same time. So I'm, a, I'm essentially like, I don't even want to say this in a bad way, but a microwave manager. Like I'm not really your manager, but I'm just consulting you. Yeah. And uh, some people I do that for free. Like some people don't even pay me, but 
a lot of people do pay me to do that. So it's like you're not a manager, but you can kind of do what a manager needs. Exactly. To do. I'm like an office manager. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's almost like a, no, but you know how like a um like like a ah uh, dang it's like a uh, it's a a personal assistant, but like a virtual assistant. Can so I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can someone hire you mm -hmm. and not need a manager? Yeah. So I think you're a manager. Like I would, you yeah, know, you can. Yeah. yeah, you can hire me and not need a manager. Yeah, for sure. Like I can say I'm managed by Darren Hicks. You could say that, or Rise to Rain. I would just say. Yeah, most people just use Darren Hicks. Darren, I don't okay. know why, sure. but okay. but yeah, there's some people that say that I manage them, and maybe I would consider it consulting. But I don't. I'm not about to have that conversation right, with right, you. Right. If you feel like I'm managing you, then sure. Feel but comfortable in that. Yeah, look, yeah. as long as I'm doing my job, I don't. You know, whatever you want to call it. It's up to you. So I want to I want to send this out to we're going to post this and send it out to all the artists that we got you. Of, all right. So uh, as the 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 authority figure that you are, what is the worst or what is what are some pet peeves that artists approach you with or just about artists or working? I with? dislike when I get DMs. Yo, bro. I don't know you. And it's not that I'm being bougie or like I don't want to talk to you. It's just you just you're just saying, yo, bro, you don't say what you want. You don't say what you need. You don't say who you are. There's no introduction to anything. It's just, yo, bro. Or somebody sent me to your DM like, so how about you tell me everything else? Because I'm not I'm me personally. It's too many DMs now. Like if I show you my DMs, bro, like if I show you my phone, I have 500 unread messages like and it's not because I'm bad communicator. Like you can <laughs> ask my you can ask my artists who talk to me. I communicate very well. But I don't like conversation. I don't like small talk. Let's get to why you're DMing me because you're DMing me for a purpose. I'm not on so I'm on social media socially, but I'm essentially only on social media to promote music and to be on business. there for business. Yeah. I'm not really there for anything else. Social. Hey, exactly. Darren, how's exactly. it going? <laughs> exactly. Especially not from no artists. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so I think I hate that. I hate the yo bros. I hate the just send me random music without saying anything. I feel like it would come off way more well received if someone were to introduce themselves. Hey, how you doing? I've heard a lot about you. I feel like, um, you know, I need help in these areas. And even if it doesn't work out, at least now I'm looking at you like, a professional not a yo bro you know what i mean and if it's people you know it's, of course fine hit them with the yo bro it's people that i know from back in the day that rap now and they hit me up yo bro i'm gonna hit you up yo bro because i know you from back in the day not because i'm about to answer your right. musical question like it's almost out of social obligation i'm going to respond exactly to you, exactly and a know. lot of people nowadays they just they go right to your bougie or your you know i feel like there is a sense of you have to be aloof in a sense right because everybody can't have access that's just that's just what it is in this industry and i think i had to learn that in the beginning because i thought people were being mean or cruel when they didn't want to talk to me but it wasn't that it was when you're focused on what you got going on if you're not trying to add to that or bring some type of different energy then people aren't really receptive to it you know what i mean wow. and i feel like as artists you have to have that sense of I don't want to, you have to feel connected with your audience, but you also got to feel like you're separate from your peers, right? So it's, it goes in both ways for everybody. You know what I mean? Like people, Beyonce isn't Beyonce because she's just good at music. It's like, there's a sense of like, Beyonce's untouchable. Yeah, like, yeah. there's an aura. Yeah, you know what I mean? And that's built, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying everybody's like that, but there's that sense for mostly all the bigger artists. They have this sense about them that's like oh like mysterious in a, in a sense but they also bring you into a sense to where you feel like you're a part of the journey so it's a it's a it's a balancing act for sure and on the flip side i'm going to ask you what is something that an artist can do to stand out when they are trying to get this uh level of help or assistance i think professionalism like i just said though professionalism will get my attention over anything okay I mean, so nothing in their gimmick nothing in their nothing, nothing in, in their your gimmick image, i mean marketing i feel like a lot of people that come to me don't know what they're doing so if you're coming to me nine times out of ten you don't know what you're doing and i probably won't like most of the stuff because like they probably won't have a bunch of videos and a bunch of stuff that i'm that i think is really good because they don't know what they're doing 
there are established artists and um, talent that come to me, but in that sense, we just get right to work. You know what I mean? It's not really too much to talk about because you already have motion. I'm just here to elevate it. You know what I mean? But if you're reaching out to me and you need to get my attention, either pay attention to what I'm already doing and try to emulate that or be professional. But I post everything. So you might not know my background moves, but you see what the videos look like. You see what the content's looking like. Just copy it then. You know what I mean? Not in a sense of like copy work, like bar for bar or like video yeah. for video, but like take a little bit from it and create it your own, mm -hmm. you know? Or take it as serious as we're taking of it. Of course. That's something that he and I were talking about with, with like getting interns for our media company. And I think a lot of artists don't understand what management is. I'm in your life. <laughs> I am literally your best friend. Like I'm right here with you. Like, <laughs> like for real, bro. Like if somebody, somebody has a death in the family, somebody has, you have a baby, all of this affects my ability to be your manager. So I, if somebody died in your family, somebody died in my family. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you break up with a girl, we broke up with that girl. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? Like I'm serious. And I don't think people really understand that. Like it takes so much out of my own time to do shit for other artists, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, everybody wants it for them. Like, artists are so one-track minded. This is every artist. This is not a dig on anybody. These are my artists, this is your artist, anybody's artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are all thinking about themselves because it's your career, you're supposed to. But I'm not thinking about just your career. I'm thinking about your career, my career, somebody else's career. Like, it's so much other stuff going on. But when I'm working with you, you have to feel like your career is the only thing that matters to me. Is that exhausting? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 That sounds like, it literally sounds like having a bunch of wives that you have to eat, make each one yeah. feel like they are. And at one point, wife. I felt like it was like <laughs> having kids, like actually having children. Yeah. Because sometimes artists are like, I don't want to do music anymore. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> get that ass up yeah <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> we're gonna do this music <laughs> you're signing me now <laughs> we're gonna do this music <laughs> what are you talking about you're not gonna waste my time that's hilarious for real bro for real i'm serious man it, it is exhausting and i i also think that artists take it take for granted their uh management you know what i mean i don't think managers get enough credit in general you know what i mean there's not even a lot of managers to even be given credit to, but it's like the ones that are really good, they don't get the credit that they're due. Do you notice um, a specific characteristic or a specific um, commonality with Jersey artists in particular? I think Jersey artists think they're better than what they are. All of them. And I'm not saying they're not good, but there's a big headedness about Jersey artists, like a, just a sense of entitlement, should I say. And even when you say the, when I say these things, people might take them negatively, but they're not negatively. Uh, I, I don't think they should be taken negatively. I think I could even use words like confidence, right? Like Jersey artists are confident, um, but they always feel like they're the ones being left out, right? Like no, like since since we don't have like this big industry, everybody feels like they should be the next one, right? Or I'm gonna be the one that t brings us all out of this. Like there's a savior complex, and then there's also a but it's me complex. Like you know what I mean? Mm. So I think that's a commonality right there. I don't feel like we sound like anybody. I feel like we you can't tell the artist is from Jersey. If you play some music from a couple artists that are like good around here. You won't be able to be like, they're from here or they from here. Like, you might mess it up because Jersey artists don't have, we don't have a sound per se. We're very versatile. Yeah. So I will say that too. But the commonality is like the, I'm going to be the next one. Like, there's mm -hmm. there's that in all of them. Mm. That savior complex is an interesting comment. Yeah. It's like they're entitled to have the ego because no one else made it. Yeah, so like it's, exactly. I'm exactly. Wow. Or he did that how many ever years ago? So now it's my turn. Like, there's there's a lot of that all over the place. Everybody thinks they're going to be the next one. 
it's crazy how much that can affect opportunity. It does. If it, it affects opportunity, it f- affects collaboration, mm-hmm. it affects egos. Like it just affects everything. Like a lot of people don't want to work together around here, and a lot of it is ego driven. It has nothing to do with talent or if both people can benefit from the situation. It's all about egos. I don't want that person to get ahead of me, or I don't want to give that person my motion. I don't want them to know what I'm really doing behind the scenes. You know what I'm saying? Did you see Albie Al on that interview recently talking about Sue Surf? No, I I seen the interview, but I didn't even okay. see that po- that clip. Yeah, but what was he? He saying? has a clip where he's talking about Jersey, mm-hmm. and he's he's like, it was kind of similar to what you're saying. Like he was kind of saying the negative things. He was like, I'm not shitting on it, but I'm saying like this is how it is. Like it's kind of like a crabs in a barrel kind of thing. It definitely is. He was like, he was saying like, he was using Surf as the example. And he was using himself as an example because he was kind of like that before Surf. Like he was mm-hmm. kind of like there before first. Um, and they're North Jersey, so it is a little bit different. But sure, right, right, right. In a sense, they don't have their own. They're they're instead of them being Philly like us, they're New York. Correct, correct. So it's essentially a similar right. idea. And he was saying how like Sue Surf. He was like nobody in Jersey can rap with Sue Surf. So he was kind of saying like, why don't we as Jersey look at that and then appoint him to be the person that we're gonna push to put on Jersey? It's like yeah. nobody. Even when we know that person is the person in Jersey, we don't really get behind. But them. a lot of times, I'm not speaking for Surf because yeah. I don't know Surf. Yeah, yeah. But I can speak for artists that have been hailed that guy around here, yeah. and this is not pointing fingers at anybody specifically. Yeah. But there have been times where people have been popping in this area, and yeah, we're all b- on board. But that artist is not the most um, likable in a personable sense. Yeah, like they're not yeah. personable. They're not. They still have that complex that I'm telling you about. Like, if I feel like the person that's going to be pushed to that next level has to come with some type of humility. Like, they have to be, like, grateful to be in that position. Instead of, the, I understand the confidence of I'm supposed to be here, but then, but everybody else doesn't have to be here with you, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's that. It's like, it's like it's, you're just thinking your way to a new ceiling. Like, that's a, you kind of got to think larger than that. Yeah, and the fact that you got there, you already kind of elevated past the surface level thinking. But then it's like, you got to now see it bigger than that. Like exactly, you got to kind of always got to see it. Like I feel like everybody's just so focused on being top in Jersey instead of yeah. like seeing the bigger picture of like what Jersey could be. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like once somebody gets on, or gets on to to the standards of like, you know, because there's a lot of people really doing that at a high level, making yeah. money. You know what I mean. But I'm talking about like the. A Jersey you know, bred mainstream. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 for sure. Like the, you know, like how Philly got Meek and Uzi, you know what I mean? He did say, you're right. He did say Fetty mm-hmm. Wap as well. He did and you say seen Fetty what, and, right. and Fetty Wap went crazy, but Fetty Wap, but that's also in North Jersey, right? Like North Jersey has them more closely than we do, right? Because they're closer to New York, which is a bigger mecca than Philly would, would even be. Because Philly, We didn't help put like, yes. but he also, yes. but I can't always put that. I can't put that on everybody either because he was doing stuff. He had no business doing in the streets too. Like he ain't sure. You know? Right, 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 right. I'm just saying, if you get to that point at a certain point, like how little baby was talking about it, like he was still in the streets for a while. And then at a certain point you got to realize like, you can't do I'm him. I got to, I got to really get out and make some real, like make some real money. You know what I mean? I mean, but that, it's not a knock on Fetty. Because he was amazing. His run was ridiculous. Yeah. Two, what, Fetty three top run. tens. Fetty had a crazy His, He run. got a new album coming out, too, which I'm going to be tuned into. Really? Zoo, Zoo, is it Zoo? Zoo? It's King Zoo or something like that. Fire. Something like that. We will be giving that a listen on TSOJ, TSOJ list. We will be For sure. Listen, yeah. But So that's not a knock on him, but it's like whoever gets in that position, they need to leave the streets alone, and they need to they need to really lock in to what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like so they don't get caught that. up. Assume you know that responsibility. Exactly. That responsibility. You know what I mean? Because I think it's the quick money. I think Lil Baby was saying, like, that quick money is just it's just different. Yeah, you know what I mean? Bro. You get addicted to the quick money. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he once he found out, like, all right, I kind of got to get out of this or at least assume him to make it look like you ain't in it. Yeah. You know? So I Listen, think that's that, too. Jersey artists, we want – is this Mike? This is me, right? Yes. We want someone to uplift. We want that. There's a lot of us out here are willing to help. As the consumers, right, and as the media companies and the media platforms and the podcast and the things of that nature, we want not just one. We want multiple people. We want that, like, we want to be able to push somebody to that realm, Mm -hmm. right? Like, 
I feel like I've been talking to a lot of people as of recent, bro, and I feel like I've been getting a lot of insight of how they really feel about Jersey, and it's not that good. Yeah, and I feel like because I was, I want to say I was a, a pioneer of that time for just bringing some type of culture to Jersey when we were throwing the shows at Volume Cafe um, every other week, and I also was throwing showcases in the middle of that as well, and we put on the biggest, to this day, it's the biggest South Jersey concert, uh, independent concert ever with Keeping It Jersey. Shout out to Shout out, you hey. know, everybody that was a part of that. You know what I'm saying? We had a, yeah, yeah, I can hear that. You probably just think I'm like, what the fuck? No, 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 I can hear it. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, what what was the exact topic we were talking about? Um, I was saying how, uh, we want someone to uplift. We want someone to push forward. Um, but how did I pivot to the other thing? I don't know, but I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy that it happened to you for uh, some, the guest for once, and not me, because no, it happens to me every other episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm happy that it happened to you this time. No, because me. I remember your at your question, and then I'd be like, "How did I get to this point in the in the question?" Yeah, no, I don't know. Oh, well, I was saying that. I think I was just saying the people that tr- that are trying to help push Jersey forward, mm. it's always pushed back by some type of entity. Obviously, going back now. If I would have known that if I had gotten the police involved originally and had them be the officers and stuff, then they wouldn't have pushed back as much. If I would have get, if I would have put some money in their pocket, like involved them a little bit, yeah, yeah, then they wouldn't have been upset. But I wasn't even thinking. I'm not even thinking this needs to be a police matter. You know, we started to get bigger than what we are, what we thought we were. You know what I mean? But I feel like there's a lot of people out here that want to help Jersey, but I feel like everybody is like standing in their own way. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's not a sense of working togetherness. And I can I can honestly say that over the years I have like worked with less people. And that's just because either a lot of people don't work in the music industry anymore or because I, my vision is just bigger, you know, than what everybody's looking to do. Let me ask you a question with your with with digital marketing. Mhm. Is looking at a place like Jersey even, like, you know how you have, like, target audiences and yes. target places? You're saying, am I even target targeting Jersey yeah. at all? Now, for Jersey artists, I am. Okay. Because that's where you're from. Like, so, like, if y'all see sponsorships or y'all y'all see sponsorships on Instagram where it'd be an artist that you never even heard of, but they're from Jersey, and that's how you got to know them. So, yeah, in a sense, we do. But if you're ju- if you were just talking about artists that are from Atlanta or an artist from Kentucky or whatever, I'm probably not hitting Jersey, no. But that's the case for anybody. I'm not going to hit Kentucky for or, a Jersey right. person. Like, right. I'm going to hit the Kentucky for the Kentucky guy. I guess that's what I was going to say. I guess what I was going to say is, is there a digital marketing strategy where you kind of almost ignore, if you're from a small market like New Jersey, for example, you kind of e- just ignore even trying to... No. Absolutely okay. not. Okay. I'm going to tell you why I said that. Mm-hmm. Um, and this may be a bad example. But just hear me out. Soul Child. Okay. Has a fan Shout base. Shout out Soul Child. Soul, Soul Child. Yeah, she's fucking amazing. She just talked to my class like a few weeks ago. Um, she has a fan base away from Jersey. Okay. Right? Like, like a large fan base that's not New Jersey, yeah. right? And some, by the looks of it, I could be very wrong, so I'm speaking with just like my two eyes. Uh, it looks like her fan base there might be larger than in New Jersey. Which may very much be true. Yeah. So I guess what I was saying is... But I think it was the ignore part of your question that you asked me. If you're saying focus more in other areas, then actually yeah. focus. But the completely ignore is like a no. Okay. You know what I mean? Like Soul Child's going to want to still be able to throw a show in Jersey and sell it out. You know what I mean? Right. Like you're not going to want to... Obviously, it feels good to have that love from everywhere else. Yeah. But... I feel like if you can't throw a show in your area and have 300, 400 people come out, which is not that much to me personally, yeah, yeah. but it's a good number. I don't want people to feel bad about that number because that's a great that. number. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you can't do that in your area, it's like, unless you're blowing up that big in one other area, then you're going to need your, you're going to, you're going to get the local support eventually. You know what I'm saying? Like, it might not be right now. Like, Uzi, remember, Uzi went down to to Atlanta to get popping, right? Like, he Did was he? up here. I didn't know yeah, that. He was in Atlanta because he went with uh, DJ Drama and, oh. 
Nathan Cannon mm-hmm. and all of them. So he left and got popping and even Meek had to go link up with Ross and them to get to a different level. So like I'm not saying you don't leave your area, but like we all remember when Meek was Philly. Like Right. No, I guess what I'm saying is like artists who are from Jersey, a lot of people don't even know they're from Jersey. Right. Mm-hmm. Which So you're saying should you focus on that Jersey? Yeah, like more so, like what you is the amount of focus that goes into I think like my a, hometown I, versus like I could I could try to market myself to Chicago, Atlanta. I think and because LA. of the era that we're in, it's hard to market yourself to your peers because everybody, like I said, it's the crab in a barrel. Most of the people that come to shows are other artists. They just kind of scout on talent. It's not like fans, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I feel like it's a really good thing, like to go to different places and network and and get fan bases in other areas. But the completely abandoning your hometown as far as marketing goes, it just doesn't make sense because I feel like if you can't get two, 300, 400 people to come out in your own hometown, it's like kind of hustling backwards. Something is is a little backwards. But when we are marketing, no, we're not really focusing too much on Jersey. Mm -hmm. I kind of already have my set points in Jersey for Mm -hmm. what I know works and doesn't work. But I always run it for Jersey artists, yeah, because okay. it's tangible fans. It's people that you actually going to see because some most of these people don't have the budget to, to leave Jersey, right? So they only have the budgets to pay for marketing. It's my job to get it out of Jersey, but it's also my job to get the people that you can actually touch to hear your music. So it's people that know High Note now, right, in the local area. You go to the mall, and people are like, is that High Note? They wouldn't mm. have did that if I just skipped over the marketing mm. for – you know, anything else. Like, I have kids that hit me up now. Yo, we just seen their ad for High Note over here. And I'm like, oh, okay. That, like, that means it's getting to the people it needs to get to in the area while also getting to people that are from different areas. I want to do so, – I don't think we uh, talked enough. I want to talk a little bit. I'm going to get you out of here, bro, because I know you, I know you want time. That's all good. Um, I'm enjoying the conversation. Thank you, bro. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, um, I want to talk a little bit about your artist, High Note, bro, okay. um, because I've seen his name multiple times. Yep. I haven't heard – I may have heard a song and didn't know it was him, okay. maybe, but... We definitely um, got to get you locked in. Yeah, get me locked in. Get me locked yeah. in. Um, but because he's just starting his run, though, so I'll okay. tell you that. Like, the music yeah. that he just... Re- the last single that he just released is, like, the one of the first... I think Kenneth did one other record mm-hmm. prior to that, but they were more, like, throwaways for us to just kind of see where he was at. Mm-hmm. But this, you know, Teach Us Something is, a, is, a, is his... That's what I'm seeing. Best everywhere. record yeah. right now. Okay. You know what I mean? It was... It's, it passed everything that he's already put out all together <laughs> for the one record. And that's really the first record that we, we pushed as a real single. Word. So shout out high note, man. We want to, we want to get to get familiar. Yes, we sir. definitely want to get familiar with high note for sure. For sure. Um, what other artists, standout artists do you think you have like in terms of, or artists that you enjoy working with that you, uh, you're proud of the relationship you built, you know, what other, artists um, I think, uh, I built a relationship with a ton of artists, right? Like I'm really super locked in with high note right now. Uh, Kenneth, me and him have a long lasting relationship. Obviously, he's an engineer, producer, and an artist, which is crazy to, That's you know, I kind of manage him in all those aspects. Obviously, not, not so much the engineer aspect of it, but the producer and the, um, the artist side of it. I think those are, like, that relationship with him is probably my, my most, like, sacred, uh, most appreciative relationship because we actually became friends through working and we've traveled the world and been to China and all these different things uh, together. Um, but I work with a lot of artists. I work with Rob. Uh, I don't know if you know DJ Rob. Yeah, Rob um, Music. Yeah. yeah, I work with him now. Um, been working with him for a couple of months. We haven't really gotten to anything like Major, super yeah. concrete yet. But like, you know, I, he's a good person. You know what I mean? He's one of them people that's a good person. I, I look forward to helping him. I have a, a cousin, his name's Rich Rock. He's from uh, Camden, Philly area. Um, I just started working with him, so he's he's going to be coming out with some stuff soon. So, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of all the, the relationships I have with all these different artists. Um, and I have relationships with artists I don't even manage, you know what I mean? People that just call me for advice, and I just give it. Because at the end of the day, yeah, you know, I can charge for consultations and things like that. But if it's just one question, I'm not. Yeah, if you got and, all yeah, the yeah, questions yeah. in the world, then you're going to have to pay. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. like, if you got one question, man, like, I can answer that, you know? Let me ask, you, let me ask you uh, uh, a question. What does it feel like to assume, or not assume, like you now have this power, authority, influence? Mm-hmm. Like, 
what does it mean to you that people are coming to you, whether they know you, don't know you, they've seen your work, they've heard about your work? What does it feel like, or what does it mean to you to have that kind of influence? I think at first I wasn't really, I wasn't focused on the influence because originally I started behind the scenes and I was very much so not really known and that was, I was okay with that. Uh -huh. I was okay with just doing the work behind the scenes. I didn't really want to be photographed. I didn't want any videos. I didn't want anything on me. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I wanted everything to be on the artist. And I think since I pivoted to throwing shows and digital marketing, obviously my name alone has kind of gotten some traction. I think it was really difficult to understand it at first, right? But then I take the responsibility really, really seriously, you know what I mean? Because I feel like there's always this sense of people are gatekeepers, right? I don't think I'm a gatekeeper at all. Mm. But I do think that if I notice you, I feel like people feel good about that, right? Like if I'm if I repost your stuff on my story, it people feel something. good. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I and I appreciate that, you know, and I just want to help with whatever power I have. I don't, I'm not here to tear people down or tear tear down their you know, their dreams and aspirations. I'm just here to give an honest critique. And honestly, like I said, there's been plenty of artists that I've heard and they sucked really badly. And then they worked on it. Two years later, they're nice as fuck. So. <laughs> I'm going to write down something I want to ask you, but I got to be, our cameras are dying. So gotcha. I'm going to write it down so I don't uh, lose it. Um, listen, our cameras are going, our, our cameras are tapping no out. No problem. So we gotta, I'm sure I'll be back. You will be back because we <laughs> talked about what I want you for. Yeah. So uh, we will be back. Listen, bro, um, before you go, any way you can, anything you want to plug, anything people um, can look forward to nah, coming just up? Shout out to the squad, um, Rise the Rain. Y'all know who they who y'all are. Um, shout out Hino, shout out Kenneth. If I ain't shout out Kenneth enough, shout yeah. out Kenneth again. <laughs> That's my guy for life. Um, and yeah, watch out for 2024. We got a lot of shit coming. Indeed. indeed. You know I mean? Listen, man, we're going to pick this conversation up again. There's going to be a part two for this for sure. Um, Darren, bro, thank you for sitting down with us and, and talking with us, bro. Um, it's been very insightful, very encouraging as well. Um, and we are going to have you back soon. Appreciate Please it. Please believe that. Please believe that. Um, until next time, y'all. Again, our equipment is dying out. Uh, this is Out of Jersey Podcast, y'all. Until next time.